Welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. Well, tonight, special treat, because up until I saw this man working, I didn't know what I was doing was called storytelling. Um, I just did it as part of my existence. And then I found, then then I was working at Colchester Arts Centre and this uh, the company of storytellers turned up one night and I thought, my goodness, that's, that, 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 that's called storytelling and, and because it's got a name, you can charge for it. And uh, <laughs> I thought, I'll have some of that. <laughs> and, uh, that's, uh, so... I really have, and 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 in, with enormous encouragement when I started, and uh, I had the audacity to call myself a storyteller. I got a great deal of encouragement from this man, so it is with a great joy that I, uh, uh, we we ask, uh, that we're joined by some, one of the people in the UK who actually got the whole storytelling revival going. Although, as Duncan would say, there was never a revival. Grandmothers always told stories. <laughs> the whole concept of revival is a nonsense. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, 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 but we'll allow. We, we, I, th I think Hugh has a right to claim to claim to be one of the people who got the revival going in the UK. So please, could we welcome? Could, could we give him a round of applause for Hugh Lupton? <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, I was I was going to start this uh, set of stories by uh, invoking the memory of Duncan, because uh, he always used to say, and there's a tradition among the travellers, that when you tell a story, the person you heard it from is standing just behind you. And that person, when they told the story, had the person they heard it from standing behind them and that person, you know, and so on and so on. And you get this idea that behind the storyteller, there's a line of ghosts stretching back into the shadows. And Duncan always used to say that if the ghost behind you didn't like the way that you were telling the story, he'd give you a jab in the ribs from the back. So if you see me suddenly sort of leap into the air in the middle of a story, you'll know what's happened. But um, I'm going to start with a story that um, actually Duncan did used to tell a version of this story although my version is more of an English than a Scottish version. Uh, and it's the story of a character called Jack Ostler. Jack Ostler was crossing a ploughed field and in the middle of the field, there was a hare, a big hare squatting. And Jack thought to himself, now then, and he reached down and he picked up a sharp piece of flint. He thought, now then, if I could kill that hare, I could take it to the butchers and I could sell it for half a crown. And with half a crown, I could buy a little runt piglet and I'll fatten her up on scraps. And when she's big enough, I'll put a boar across her and she'll give me a lovely little litter of piglets and I'll sell a lot of them and I'll buy myself a cow and I'll put a bull across the cow and she'll give me calves and she'll give me milk and I'll build up a nice little herd of cattle. And then I'll see if I can't marry old Weatherby's daughter from up on the big farm. We'll get wed and we'll be happy. And then there'll be a war and all Weatherby's sons will get killed. And then old Weatherby himself will die of the gout and me and my wife, We'll move up to the big farm with all of its acres and things will be looking good then. And we'll have two sons, great big strapping boys they'll be, but they'll be lazy and they won't wake up in the mornings. And every morning I'll have to stand outside their bedroom door. Wake up, you lazy beggars. And with that, off went the hare, running across the field and with it, all Jack Ostler's dreams. <laughs> that was the end of that story. Brilliant. Now, in the very, 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 very beginning, there was God and there was the devil, as you all know. And as you all know, the devil, the devil was 
was banished from paradise for some minor distant misdemeanor sitting on God's throne or something like that. He was thrown out of paradise. And more than anything else, the devil wanted to get back into paradise. And so he made his way round the walls of paradise, trying to find a crack or a hole that he could squeeze through. But there was no way back. And so the devil went to each of the animals in turn and asked them if they would help him to get back into paradise. And each of the animals in turn shook its head until the devil came to the snake. And the devil said to the snake, now then, snake, if you'll help me get back into paradise, I'll give you the sweetest flesh on earth as your food. And the snake said, well, what is the sweetest flesh on earth? And the devil said, the sweetest flesh on earth is the flesh of man, the flesh of Adam and the sons of Adam, the flesh of Eve and the daughters of Eve. And the snake thought about it for a while and he said, very well, I'll agree to that. And so it was that the devil, who's infinitely clever, shrank himself until he was no bigger than my little fingernail. And he climbed into the snake's mouth and he hid behind the snake's right fang. And the snake went sliding through the grass and through the gates of paradise. There were the angels with swords of fire and they didn't take any notice of the snake. They let him through. And he went sliding through the lovely lush green grass of paradise. And who should he meet but Eve? And we all know the story of how Eve was persuaded to take the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it wasn't the snake who was doing the talking. It was the devil who was hiding behind the right fang and shouting out of the snake's mouth. And when that whole story was finished, when Eve had taken the apple and she'd given it to Adam and when God had come walking in the still of the evening and when Adam and Eve and snake and devil had all been banished, when the whole sordid business was done and dusted, the snake went sliding through the grass towards Adam's house to claim the sweetest flesh on earth as his food. After all, that had been the bargain. And as he was sliding through the grass, it just so happened that a swallow was flying high overhead. Now, the swallow is a friend of man's. And even to this day, he builds his house in the shadow of our houses, just as he did in the time of Adam. And the swallow saw the snake and swooped down and said, snake, how do you know that the sweetest flesh on earth is the flesh of man? And the snake said, well, because the devil told me. But the devil is the devil. How do you know he was speaking the truth? Well, as the swallow and the snake were having this conversation, it just so happened that Adam was looking out of the window of his house and he overheard them talking. And he said, listen, snake, there's only one way to find out who has the sweetest flesh on earth. What we'll do is this. We'll send out the mosquito to sample the blood of every single living creature on earth. And in a year's time, we'll have a great assembly of all the animals and the birds. And whichever one the mosquito says has the sweetest flesh will be your food from that day onwards. And the snake said, very well. I'll agree to that. And so it was that Adam sent off the mosquito and the mosquito flew north, south, east and west, the length and the breadth of the world, sampling and sampling and sampling the blood of every single living creature on earth. And a year's time, a year later, there was a great assembly, all the animals and the birds and the mosquito came flying back. But the swallow was watching and waiting. And the swallow swooped down out of the sky and said, so mosquito, who has the sweetest flesh on earth? And the mosquito said, well, to tell you the truth, the sweetest flesh on earth is indeed the flesh of man, the flesh of Adam and the sons of Adam, the flesh of Eve and the daughters of Eve. And the, sw the swallow said, I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit deaf. I can't quite hear what you're saying. Could you speak a bit louder? And the mosquito opened her mouth wider to speak again. But the swallow was quick, swooped down and plucked out the mosquito's tongue. 
so that when the mosquito came to the great assembly of all the animals and the birds, all she could say was, mm, like that. Nobody could understand a word. And the animals were looking at one another and they were shaking their heads and they were shrugging their shoulders. And the swallow swooped down and perched on Adam's shoulder. And the swallow said, the mosquito is my dear friend. And the animals looked at one another and they said, it's true. Wherever you see a mosquito, there's a swallow not far behind. The mosquito is my dear friend. And before she had the terrible misfortune to lose her tongue, she confided in me and she told me that the sweetest flesh on earth is the flesh of the frog. And so it was agreed amongst all the animals and the birds that from that day onwards, the snake should eat the flesh of the frog. But the snake saw that he'd been tricked and he was furious and he reared up and he snapped at the swallow, but he wasn't quite quick enough because the swallow flew up into the sky and the jaws of the snake closed around the swallow's tail. And so it was, and so it is from that day to this, all swallows have forked tails, a snake-sized bite out of the tail. And so it was, and so it is from that day to this, all snakes have eaten the flesh of the frog. And so it was, and so it is from that day to this, all mosquitoes have said nothing but mm, like that. But the thing is, the mosquito knows that the sweetest flesh on earth is the flesh of man. And she helps herself whenever she can. And that was the end of that story. That's a true story. Um, here's another old favourite of mine that I haven't told for a while. Once upon a time, and it wasn't my time and it wasn't your time, but it was somebody's time. There was a musician and his name was Sadko. And he played the hammer dulcimer, hammering the strings with two little hammers. And he lived in the great city of Novgorod in Russia. And he was young and he was handsome, but like most musicians, he was poor. And he would play for the dancing in the city squares of Novgorod. And the women would only look at him to tell him to play faster or sweeter or softer or louder. And then they would turn back to their partners. But Sadko didn't mind. And when the dancing was finished, he'd be given a few copper coins and he'd buy himself some bread and some cheese and maybe a little bottle of vodka, maybe some salt. And he would make his way through the city gates of Novgorod. And there, the great river Volkov flowed beside the city walls. And Sadko would sit down on the riverbank and he would eat and drink and he'd wipe the grease from the corners of his mouth. And then he would put the little dulcimer on his lap and the hammers and he would begin to play. And he would play and play and he would play to the river and he would sing. And the refrain of his song was always the same. Ah, Volkov, my little river, you're more beautiful than all the women of Novgorod. Well, my story begins one time when the fisherman who fished that river, and even though he called it his little river, the truth of the matter is that the Volkov is a great wide river. The fisherman who fished the river wanted to go for a night of drinking in the taverns of Novgorod. And they asked Sadko if he would look after their nets and their fishing boats. And Sadko agreed. And so off they went to the city of Novgorod and Sadko 
settled down on the riverbank between the great piles of nets. And below him, there were the fishing boats at the quayside, and they were rattling and slurping as fishing boats do. And he settled down and the sun began to set and the night came and the sky brightened with stars. And then a beautiful full moon rose up into the sky and everything was black and gray and silver in the moonlight. And Sadko was sitting there and he took his dulcimer and he began to play. And he played and he played and he sang and he played. And as he was playing, suddenly he saw in the middle of the river, there was a whirlpool. And the little ripples were running out in all directions. And the whirlpool grew bigger and bigger. And he put down the hammers and he rubbed his eyes and he looked. And he saw out of the center of the whirlpool, a head was beginning to appear with blue dripping hair and a great craggy forehead and a nose and a blue dripping beard and broad shoulders with blue and green silk dripping water. And out of the river, out of the centre, the vortex of the whirlpool appeared the czar of the sea. And he rose up and up and up until he was towering above the masts of the fishing boats. And he waded to the edge of the river and he looked down at Sadko. And Sadko looked up at him and the czar of the sea said, Sadko of Novgorod, for many days, for many weeks, for many months, for many years, I have listened to your music and I have enjoyed your music and my daughters also. They have listened and they have enjoyed and we would like to repay you. Take one of those nets, throw it into the river and when you drag it out of the water, you'll see what you will see. And if it pleases you, you can keep it on the condition that you promise to come and play for me in my green palace beneath the waves. If it does not please you, then throw it back into the water. And Sadko said, your majesty, I promise. And the Tsar of the sea nodded and turned and he waded back into the water and the water closed over his knees and his waist and his shoulders and the top of his head. And then there was just blue hair like weed on the surface of the water. And then he was gone. But as soon as he was gone, Sadko ran across and he took one of the nets from the great pile and he made his way down to the water's edge and he flung the net into the river. And he started dragging the net and pulling it up and pulling it up. And there was nothing inside. It just dripped water. But then as he was pulling the last piece of net up the bank, he saw there was something caught inside. And he folded back the net and there was a little wooden box. And it was all encrusted with limpets and barnacles. And it was slimy with seaweed. And he took it, he put it on his lap and he opened the lid of the box. And by the light of the moon, he saw that it was full of precious stones. There were rubies and amethysts and pearls and little clusters of diamonds, like sharp knives glittering in the moonlight. Well, Sadko closed the lid of the box and he hid it in the long grass. And he took the net and he flung it onto the great pile of nets and he wrapped himself in his coat and lay on the ground and he closed his eyes and he fell into the sweet, oblivious balm of sleep. Well, the next thing he knew, he was being shaken awake. And there were the fishermen back from a night of carousal in the taverns of Novgorod. And they paid him with a couple of fish and they thanked him for his time. And Sadko lit a fire and he cooked the fish and he ate them. And as he was eating them, he was thinking to himself, that was my last meal as a poor man. When nobody was watching, he took the little box and he tucked it under his coat and he made his way through the city gates of Novgorod and he went to the marketplace and he hired a stall in the marketplace and he was very careful. He just sold one or two precious stones at a time and by selling and buying and buying and selling it wasn't long before he was a wealthy man in Novgorod and there wasn't a mother in Novgorod, 
who didn't want her daughter to dance with Sadko the merchant because he was no longer playing for the dancing, he was dancing himself. And he would dance with one and he would dance with another. But then when the dancing was finished, he would go out of the city gates and he would sit on the riverbank with his dulcimer on his knee and he would play and sing to the river. And the refrain was always the same. Ah, Volkov, my little river, you're more beautiful than all the women of Novgorod. Well, Sadko began to travel, buying and selling and selling and buying. He traveled the length and the breadth of Russia. And then he began to travel the world. And from time to time, he would come home to Novgorod with his great caravan of pack ponies and camels and horses pulling carts with rolls of carpet and silk and precious stones. And before he went through the city gates of Novgorod, he would throw a gift into the river, maybe a bracelet or a necklace or a ring or a brooch. And he would say, Volkov, my little river, you're more beautiful than all the women of the world. Well, one time, Sadko had been trading far, far, far across the world, and he was making his way home across the Caspian Sea in a great ship. And the hold of the ship was full of rolls of silk and rolls of carpet and chests full of lapis lazuli and silver. And the wind was filling the sails like a great belly and the prow of the ship was slicing through the waves. And Sadko was sitting on the deck of the ship in his great fur hat, fur coat, and he was playing the dulcimer to pass the time. And as the ship was traveling across that sea, suddenly it stopped dead. It was as though a great hand had reached up from the depths of the Caspian Sea and had caught hold of the keel of the ship. And the captain said, hoist more sails. And the sails were hoisted, but still the ship wouldn't move. The wind was filling the sails. The masts and the ropes were creaking and groaning, but the ship was motionless. And the captain said, drop plumb lines. And so they lowered plumb lines to the starboard side and the port side, and it was 70 fathoms deep, but the ship wouldn't budge. And one of the sailors, an old man, he said, there's an unlucky one aboard this ship. You mark my words, there's an evil one aboard this ship. And the other sailors began to nod their heads and they decided to draw lots and find out who the unlucky one was. And so they cut pieces of rope, one for every soul aboard the ship. And one piece was half the length of the others. And they put them into a bundle and every body had to take a lot. Even Sadko, even though Sadko owned the ship, he reached and he pulled his piece. And his was the half piece. And the other sailors gathered around him and they said, unlucky one, evil one, throw him overboard. And Sadko said, I'm not unlucky. I'm not evil. But suddenly I remember a promise that I never kept. And a strange thing then. He got up to his feet. He tucked his dulcimer under his arm. He walked across the deck. He climbed over the rail of the ship and he leapt into the water. And the moment Sadko struck the sea, the ship sped forwards like a swan's feather carried by the wind. And Sadko sank down and down and down, and the blue water became green water, and down and down and down, and the green water grew darker and darker and darker, and at last his feet rested on the seabed. And he looked about himself, and he saw in front of him there was a palace, this magnificent palace, and it was built of green timbers. All the timbers of the shipwrecks of the world had gone into the building of this great palace with its towers and its turrets and its minarets. And guarding the gates to the palace, there were two sturgeon, great fish, 150 feet long, lashing their tails. Well, Sadko made his way through the gates and the sturgeon let him past. 
and up the steps and through the doors and into the palace. And there was the hall of the palace and lying on the floor was the czar of the sea with his chin on his hand and his elbow on the seabed and his blue hair waving in the water. And when he saw Sadko, he said, ah, Sadko of Novgorod, for many days, for many weeks, for many months, for many years, I have been waiting. And now at last you've come. Sing for me. Sing for me now. And Sadko took the little dulcimer and the hammers and he began to play and he began to sing. And he sang more beautifully than he'd ever sung before. And when he'd finished, the Tsar of the Sea said, Sadko of Novgorod, that was good. But now I want to dance. Play me a dance tune. And so Sadko began to play a dance tune, hammering and hammering and hammering with the hammers against the strings. And the Tsar of the Sea got up to his feet and he strode out of the hall. And Sadko was following him, playing and playing and playing. And the Tsar of the Sea made his way through the gates and Sadko was following him. And when he was beyond the two great sturgeon, the Tsar of the Sea began to dance, spinning and stamping his feet and waving his arms faster and faster, he span and he span. And as he was spinning and stamping, he began to swell. He grew bigger and bigger until he stood as tall as a mountain and his feet were like two hills. And still he was stamping and dancing. And with the dancing of the czar of the sea in this world, there were terrible storms. Whole ships were lifted and smashed against cliff faces. Whole cities were swamped by the ocean. And then slowly, the czar of the sea shrank back down into himself. And he said, Sadko of Novgorod, that was excellent. Stay with me. Become a prince of the ocean. Marry one of my daughters. Play for me always. And he strode back into his palace and Sadko followed him. And when the Tsar of the sea was in the hall of his palace, he clapped his hands and a door opened. And one after another into the hall came the daughters of the Tsar of the sea. And every one of them was beautiful. But as each one stepped into the hall, Sadko said, my little river is more beautiful than all the women of the world. And 60, 70, 90, 100 daughters, and Sadko was shaking his head, and 120 daughters, and 130 daughters, the hall was full of daughters, and still they were coming in. And then at last, the youngest of all the daughters of the Tsar of the Sea stepped into the hall. And Sadko went across to her, and he looked into her face, and he said, you alone are as beautiful as my river. And the Tsar of the Sea said, what is the name of this river of yours? And Sadko said, my river is called the Volkov. And the Tsar of the Sea threw back his head and he laughed. And he said, that also is the name of my youngest daughter. And she came forward and she seized Sadko's hands. And they kissed. And as he kissed her, he saw she was wearing around her throat one of the necklaces that he'd thrown as a gift into the river. And she said, Sadko, come with me. And she took his hand and she led him to her palace. And there was a great chest and she opened the lid of the chest and inside it, all the gifts, the necklaces, bracelets, brooches, rings that he'd thrown into the river. And he said, Volkov, Volkov, my little river, I found you at last. And soon enough, there was a wedding. Sadko was married to Volkov. And after the wedding, a great wedding feast. I wish you'd all been there. And when the wedding feast was finished, Sadko and Volkov went upstairs to the bedchamber where they were to sleep that night. And they lay down on the bed. And Volkov said, Sadko, you'll never leave me, will you? And Sadko said, no, I will always be by your side. And they fell asleep. But then in the middle of the night, Sadko rolled over in his sleep 
and his foot touched Volkov's leg and her leg was icy cold. It was as cold as ice in January. It was so cold that Sadko woke up and he opened his eyes and he looked about himself and he was lying under the city walls of Novgorod on the riverbank with one foot in the water and high overhead, a full moon shining in the sky. And that was the end of that story. If it be bitter or if it be sweet, carry some away and bring some back. Um, thank you. <laughs> One of the things that got me interested in telling stories uh, many, many years ago was the ballads, the old ballads, the old story songs. And I'd like to sing one of them for you now, one of my favourites. <clears throat> Come all you maids, you pretty, pretty maids, had a warning take by me, don't go down to the chaser's wood. If a maid you would return, return, if a maid you would return. Lady Margaret, Lady Margaret, she was sitting in her bower. She's fair as any rose, but she longs to go down to the chaser's wood and pick them flowers that grow, that grow, and pick them flowers that grow. So she's picked up her little silver comb. She's made haste to comb her hair and she's up and away to the chaser's wood as fast as she could tear, could tear, oh, as fast as she could tear. But she had not picked one red, red rose, one rose from the wood so green, when a voice says, lady, how dare you take a rose without any leave of me, of me, oh, without any leave of me. And she had not picked one red, red rose, one rose but barely three, when Tam of the Lynn stepped out of the hill, saying, you've never once asked my leave, my leave. Oh, you've never once asked my leave. Well, she said, this wood, it is my very own. And my father give it to me. And I will pick, pluck, bend or break a branch without any leave of thee, of thee. Oh, without any leave of thee. Well, he's taken her then by the lily white hand. He's pulled her down to the grass so green. And what they did there, I never could say. For the green grass grew between, between, oh, the green grass grew between. Well, there's four and twenty ladies, all in her father's hall, and they're all playing at chess. But Lady Margaret, she's sitting all by herself, and she's green as any glass, glass. Oh, she's green as any glass. And one of them ladies, she's lifted up her head and she's begun to smile, saying, I think our ladies loved a little long. And now she goes with child, with child. Oh, now she goes with child. And another of them ladies, she's lifted up her head. How oh, beautiful was she. She says there grows a little herb in the chaser's wood. As a twine your babe from thee, from thee. As a twine your babe from thee. Well, Lady Margaret, she's picked up her little silver comb. She's made haste to comb her hair and she's up and away to the chaser's wood as fast as she could tear, could tear. Oh, as fast as she could tear. But she had not plucked that bitter little herb, that herb that grows on the loam when Tam of the Lynn stepped out of the hill saying, Margaret, leave it alone. Oh, sweetheart, oh, Margaret, leave it alone. Why would you take that bitter little herb, that herb that grows so grey, except to twine the pretty little babe that we got in our play, our play, that we got in our play? Oh, tell me, Tam of the Lynn, says she, if a mortal man you be. Oh, I'll tell you the truth without the word of a lie. I was christened as good as thee, as thee, I was christened as good as thee. 
But as I rode out one bitter, bitter day, down from my horse I fell, and the queen of the Elvins carried me away in yon green hill for to dwell, to dwell, in yon green hill for to dwell. And every seven, seven years, a tithe they pay to hell, and the last to come is the first to go. And I fear that it's myself, myself. Oh, love, I fear that it's myself. But tonight it is the Halloween, when the elven court must ride. And if you would your true lover save, then down by the mill bridge hide, hide, oh, down by the mill bridge hide. And first will come a black horse and then will come a brown and then will come the white. Oh, throw your arms around my waist. I will not you a fright, a fright. I will not you a fright. And the woods, they grew dark and the woods, they grew dim. And Tamalin was gone, and she's lifted up her lily white feet, and she's down to the mill bridge, run, run. Oh, she's down to the mill bridge, run. And she's looked high and she's looked low. She's compassed all around, but she's nothing seen, she's nothing heard. She's heard no mortal sound, sound. Oh, she's heard no mortal sound until the dead hour of the night. When she heard their bridles ring, oh, it's quickened her heart and it's given her a start. More than any mortal thing, thing, oh, more than any mortal thing. And first they come the black horse and then they come the brown and then they come the white. And she's thrown her arms around his waist and he did not her a fright, a fright. He did not her a fright. And the thunder rolled across the sky and the stars blazed bright as day. And the queen of the Elvins gave a thrilling cry. Oh, young Tamlins, away, away. Oh, young Tamlins, away. And they've changed him then all in her arms into a lion so wild, but she's held him tight and she's feared him not. He's the father of her child, her child. He's the father of her child. And they changed him then all in her arms to a dog that snaps and bites. But she's held him tight and she's feared him not. And he did not her a fright, a fright. He did not her a fright. And they changed him then all in her arms into a writhing snake. But she held him tight and she feared him not. He was one of God's own make, own make. He was one of God's own make. And they changed him then all in her arms to a red hot bar of iron. But she held him tight and she feared him not. And he's done to her no harm, no harm. He's done to her no harm. And they changed him then all in her arms to a mother naked man. And she's thrown her cloak around him then. Saying, Tamalin, we've won, we've won. Oh, Tamalin, we've won. And the Queen of the Elvins, she's cursed young Tamalin. She's cursed young Tamlin. Good, saying, I should have torn out your eyes, Tamlin, and put in two eyes of wood, of wood, and put in two eyes of wood. Oh, curses on you, Tamalin. Once you were my very own. And when you were, I should have torn out your heart and put in a heart of stone, cold stone, and put in a heart of stone. Whoa. That's the story of, the story of Pamela. Beautiful. Pamela Lynn. <laughs> so wonderful. <laughs>
Many years ago, there lived a woman of power, and her name was Kerid Wen. And even to this day, scholars are arguing about the meaning of her name. They all agree that the Wen means wan or white, but the Kerid, some say it means weasel, some say it means sow, some say it means the hinge to a door, some say it means inspiration. But Kerid Wen, she lived on an island in a great lake in the north of Wales. And she had two children. She had a daughter and a son. And the daughter was beautiful. And she was as clever as she was beautiful. And it was said of her that the poppies of the field tried to imitate the creamy whiteness of her brow. And they failed so miserably. They've all brushed, blushed bright red ever since. That was the daughter, but also there was a son, and the son was of such impenetrable stupidity that he was given the name Avagthi, which means utter darkness. And on account of this son, Kerit Wen decided to boil a cauldron of inspiration. The cauldron was to seethe and bubble and boil for a year and a day, and when a year and a day was over, there would be three distilled drops charged with prophetic knowledge and poetic insight. And these three were to be put onto the tongue of Avagthi to counteract the stupidity. And so it was that Kerid Wen set about gathering the ingredients for the great cauldron, according to the season and the phases of the moon, Cassia, Moonwort, Hellebore, Heart's Ease, Mercury, Silver, Salt, Minerals and Herbs thrown into the cauldron. And from a village on the edge of the lake, she kidnapped a little mortal child called Guion Bach. And his job was to stir the cauldron over the flames of the fire. And what he didn't know was that such was the secrecy of the ingredients of that cauldron, that when the year and the day was over, his own throat was to be slit from ear to ear. But all unknowing, Guion Bach stirred the cauldron and stirred the cauldron, enchanted by the strange, dark beauty of the woman coming and going with the ingredients and hurling them into the cauldron. And three months passed and the boy was stirring and stirring and six and nine and a year passed and the boy was stirring and stirring the great cauldron. And then it was the day beyond the year. And on the surface of the liquid, a black bubble formed, a greasy, oily black bubble. And suddenly the bubble burst and three drops flew into the air and landed on Guion Bach's finger. And without thinking what he was doing, such was the heat of those three drops against his skin that he put his finger to his mouth. And straight away, it was as though his thoughts had been polished and infused with light. It was as though all past and all future had no horizon any longer. And in his mind's eye, he saw the death that had been planned for him. And with his outer eye, he saw Kerid Wen striding towards him, her face exploding with fury. And Guion Bach dropped the wooden spoon and he turned and he ran. And he ran and he ran and she was pursuing him. And she was so consumed by her anger that she took the form of a terrible hag with a long black lolling tongue and bright red eyes. And Guion Bach was running and running and in his thoughts he was hair. He was hair leaping and bounding into the space before him and he turned into a hare and she became a greyhound. And the hare was swift, but the greyhound was swifter. And so Guion Bach leapt into the waters of the lake and in his thoughts he was fish straining into the space before him and he turned into a trout and away he swam. But she leapt into the water and she became an otter. And the trout was swift, but the otter was swifter. And so he leapt out of the water and in his thoughts he was bird and he turned into a crow and away he flew. But she leapt out of the water and she became a hawk and the crow was swift, but the hawk was swifter and the hawk swooped down and dug its claws into the neck of the crow. But the crow turned into a grain of wheat and fell down out of the sky. 
and she became a black hen, flapping and fluttering down out of the sky, and she scratched and she pecked, and she pecked and she scratched, until she found the one grain among the many, and boom, she swallowed it. And that grain of wheat took root in the womb of Keridwen. And the weeks and the months passed, and she grew big with the grain of wheat. Three months, six months, nine months passed, and she lay on her back and she gave birth to a baby boy. And she knew who this child was, and no sooner born than she took a knife and she was going to slit his throat from ear to ear. But she made the mistake of looking into his face. And he was beautiful. He was her own child. His forehead was shining with light. And she dropped the dagger clattering onto the ground. She couldn't bring herself to kill. And she made a little coracle out of withies and leather and pitch. And she wrapped the baby in animal skins. And she put the baby into the coracle and she tucked the coracle under her arm. And she set off. She made her way across the lake, through the valleys and over the mountains until she came to the cold grey salt sea. And she threw the coracle splash into the ocean. And for how many days, for how many weeks, for how many months or years or hundreds of years, that coracle was carried spinning and tossing by the waves and the currents and the tides of the ocean, I don't know. But in all that time, the baby wrapped in animal skins didn't age by one single day. And then, one time, and my story moves now from mythological time to historical time, one time there was a Welsh prince, I hesitate to call him a prince of Wales, I'll call him a Welsh prince, a Welsh prince, and his name was Elphin. And he was a bit of a drunkard and a bit of a wastrel, and he was heavily in debt. He was a nephew of King Malgun of Gwyneth, the north part of Wales, a historical king. You can see his, you read about him in the annals. And um, Elfin, poor Elfin, it was towards the end of April and the salmon were beginning to run. And he went to his uncle and he said, please, can I have the fishing rights to the River Dovey? The estuary of the River Dovey, where the fresh water meets the salt water. And the king said, I see no reason why not. And so it was on May Eve, Elfin went down to the estuary of the River Dovey and he stretched nets across the water. And he sat on the riverbank and he waited. And the sun set and the night came and the sky brightened with stars and the moon rose and the moon fell. And at last it was dawn, the first light of morning. And Elfin waded into the water to see what he'd caught. And there was nothing. There were no fish, not one single salmon. There was something tangled in the nets. And he reached down and he picked it up and it was a little coracle encrusted with barnacles and limpets and slimy with seaweed. And there was something inside wrapped in animal skins. And he carried it to the riverbank and he put it down onto the ground and he folded back the animal skins and they became warmer and warmer. And there was a baby a newborn baby boy with his umbilical cord still winding over his belly and his forehead shining with light. And Elfin looked down at him. He said, I'll call you Taliesin, shining brow. And he lifted the baby and he wrapped him in his cloak and he climbed onto his horse's back and he rode homewards. But as he was riding homewards, he started thinking about his bad luck. He started thinking about his debts and the lack of fish in the nets and this baby who was just another mouth to feed. And the more he thought about these things, the more miserable he became. And the tears began trickling down his cheeks. And one of the tears dribbled down his beard and dripped, splash, onto the face of the baby. And the baby opened his eyes and opened his mouth and spoke, dry your tears. Sweet Elfin, never in any river was such good fortune as this. I am Taliesin. 
I sing perfect meter that will last until the end of the world. And Alfred said, what are you, man or spirit? And the baby said, Guion Bach, I once was, and evermore, I'm Taliesin. Alfred was amazed. And he galloped home and there was his castle. It wasn't much of a castle. The place was falling down. The cattle were thin. The crops had failed for year after year after year. And standing in the doorway was his wife, dressed in little more than rags. And she saw Elfin. She said, well, Elfin, what did you catch? How many fish? And Elfin climbed down from his horse's back. And he said, I didn't catch any fish, but I did catch a poet. And he gave the bundle to his wife. And his wife looked at him and he, she shook her head. She said, you wastrel, you scoundrel. But then the baby opened his eyes and opened his mouth and began to speak. I am Taliesin. I sing perfect meter that will last until the end of the world. I know why there is an echo in a hollow. I know why breath is black, why liver bloody and why silver shines. I know why a cow has horns and why a woman loves. I know why milk is white, why holly green, why ale is bitter, why sea is salt and why berries red. I know of the beasts at the sea's bed. I know how many spears make a confrontation and how many drops a shower of rain. I know why fishes have scales and why swans feet are black. I have been a blue salmon. I've been a stag, a dog, a roebuck on the mountain, a stock, a spade, an axe in the hand, a hare, a trout, a crow in the air. I fell to the ground as a grain of wheat. I was pecked and swallowed by the black hen. For nine months in her crop I lay. I have been dead. I have been alive. I am Taliesin. Elfin and his wife, they were amazed. And they looked after the baby. And the baby grew as any baby would grow. But in knowledge, in language, he was beyond all learning. It was as though his tongue and the breath that moved over it was as old as time itself. And it was a wonderful thing to see the baby sitting up in his cradle, lecturing his parents on the mysteries of creation, on paradise and the fall and the gates of paradise and the hierarchies of angels. And it was a wonderful thing to see him on a little stool in the orchard talking about time upon time and once upon a time, because we can be sure he knew all of the stories. And from the moment the baby was found, Elfin's luck took a turn. It wasn't long before his cattle were fat, his crops were burgeoning, his castle was rebuilt. And so it was, the Taliesin, the greatest poet ever to have walked the face of the earth, first came into this world. I am Taliesin. I sing perfect meter that will last until the end of the world. I am Elfin's chief bard. I've been on the windy hill a year and a day in stocks and fetters. I've been on the windy cross with the merciful son of God. I am a wonder whose origin is not known. I have danced on the galaxy at the heart of order. I have spoken before receiving the gift of speech. I have been teacher to all intelligences and it is not known whether my body is fish or flesh. I have been for nine months in the womb of Kerithwen, Guion Bach I once was, and evermore am Taliesin. And that is the end of that story. Oh, that was amazing. Oh. Thank you. That was brilliant, you. Well, I'd like to finish with this little story. I don't know if you can see this instrument. Um, it's a Mbira, West African instrument. And this is a story that comes from Africa, but it comes from uh, further south. It comes from uh, Bots what's now Botswana. It's a Bushman story. Whoops. So once upon a time, an 
and it wasn't my time and it wasn't your time. There was hair. And it was night time. There was a beautiful full moon shining high overhead and hair was in the middle of a field, a great field. And everything was black and gray and silver in the moonlight. And hair was running across the field and suddenly hair heard a voice. Hair, hair, hair. And hair looked to the left and the right. He couldn't see anybody. Hair. And hair looked up and there was the moon. And the moon was speaking to him. And the moon said, hair, listen, I've got a message and I want you to carry it to the people. And hair nodded his head up and down. And the moon said, Hare, listen and remember, this is the message I want you to carry to the people of the world. Like me, all men die. And dying, they live. And Hare nodded his head up and down and he set off at a run to where the people were. And all the time he was turning the message over and over in his mind, like me, all men die and living, die and dying, live and living, dying. And when he got to the people, he said, I've got a message from the moon. And the people came out of their huts and their houses and away from their fires. And they made a great circle around Hare. And Hare said, I've got a message for the people from the moon. And the people said, Hare, tell us the message. And Hare said, my message is this, the message that I bring you from the moon. Like me, all men live and living, they die. The people looked at one another and they looked at hair and they nodded their heads up and down and they made their way back into their houses. And hair went running away out of the village and across the fields and moon had been watching and listening. And Moon saw that Hare had got the message wrong and he was furious. And Moon reached down, picked up a stone, flung it at Hare and hit Hare on the lip and split Hare's lip. And so it was, and so it is, from that day to this, all Hares have had split lips. And so it was, and so it is, from that day to this, all the people have got the message wrong. Three golden apples fell out of the sky. One of them was for me because I told the stories. One of them is for you because you listened and you heard the stories. And the last one I take in my hand and I throw it over my shoulder for all those ghosts standing behind. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, where the stories came from. The first one, the story of um, Jack Ostler and the hare, as I said at the beginning, is a well, Duncan used to tell it, so it's a Scottish story. It's, I know it as an English story, um, which I first came across through Alan Garner. Um, the second story I told, The Sweetest Flesh on Earth, the story of how the swallow got, got the fork tail. That's um, a story from Palestine. The story of Sadko, the merchant, is from Russia, from a wonderful collection of stories, Old Peter's Russian Tales, some of you might know. Uh, the story of Tamlin, the Ballad of Tamlin, is from the Scottish borders. Actually, Duncan used to sing a version of that as well. Um, and the uh, story of um, Taliesin from that great tangle of tales, which has come to be known as the Mabinogion. Although actually, ta the story of Taliesin is slightly separate, but part of that body of story. And um, the story of Hare and Moon is, as I said, it's a Bushman story from um, Botswana, Southern Africa. So one apple is for me because I told, one for you because you listened, and the last one I take in my hand and I throw it over my shoulder for all those people who first found the stories many, 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 many years ago, and who they all are, we'll never, ever know. Thank you for listening.
you. That was amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Under normal circumstances, we'd retire to the bar and <laughs> buy you a drink. Yes. Yeah. But you still have the opportunity. He's going to have to send out the offie for it himself or maybe buy it online. <laughs> but if you go to the worldstorytellingcafe.com site, you will see next to Hugh's name a little hat. If you click on that hat, you can drop whatever you like, a euro, a dollar, or ten, um, or, and, or, or pounds, whatever you like. But, um, but you, and then Hugh can just, um, just retire to the bar in his own house and have a drink <laughs> on us. But right now, Thanks, <laughs> um, has, we, we, you know, we, we don't often have the opportunity to have, uh, have Hugh in our front room. So has, so has anyone got a question for it? Yes. Stephanie. Yes, this is Hi, Stephanie. Grand. Hello. Um, I'm John's partner, Hugh. Um, ah, yeah, hi. Hi. Um, can I just ask, I love your Metamorphosis CDs. And oh, yeah. John said you brought some more out. John, did you actually get them? And if you did, did you ever give them to me? And um, if no. not, could you get them? No, um, well, actually, Hugh, well, that, that, that's, a, that's a nice plug. If people want to buy your stuff in, in this time, how can they get, how, how can they, because you... How you, can John CDs correct and... his failure to buy me your last CD? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there, there is a website and you can buy them online. Thank you. It's just, just, it's just my name. Called? If you Google... Um, Hugh Lupton. <laughs> yeah, my name, it's, uh, it's, it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's yes. Hugh Lupton dot co.co.uk or something. Okay, yeah, yeah. W -W no, no, I, I, I was actually, got, I was going to pass by the farm at some point in Norfolk and yeah. blame COVID. Blame yeah, COVID, I've not had the opportunity. The fact yeah. you've been asking me to buy those things for two years is irrelevant. <laughs> 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 I've been promising to visit you for two years as well, or longer. Yeah, there, there are that's, some That's lovely. Yeah. yeah. But if anybody listening likes... The Greek stories. Yes. Um, Hugh did them with Daniel Morden, and Metamorphosis is just amazing, especially when we're allowed out properly on a long road trip, just to listen, as long as they're not too hypnotic for you. Um, mm -hmm. just to listen and drive and hear the whole thing. It's absolutely fabulous. I really recommend that C D selection of it. Oh my God, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you for the many I have hours one question, Hugh. Yeah. Had, are you writing a new novel? I like Severed Heads better than almost anything I've ever read. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think yes, I've read I am, it three or four times. I am, I am writing one, but it's very different. Uh huh. It's called It's called The Snake of Dreams, and it's uh, it's kind of about the nineteen uh, sixties and the early nineteen seventies. Well, I would like that too, <laughs> since I lived through that time. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I think I've got I'm, everything I'm, I'm you ever did. I'm hoping it's going to come out in the next uh, year or so. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. It's a lie when they say if you can remember them, you weren't there. That's about all I can remember. But it has <laughs> blotted out yeah. everything. Ever since. Everything else has gone, but that's still there. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm similar, John. You, I, I remember. Am I uh, on? No. Yes. I remember. Hi, Norman. Yeah. Remember this. The after your performance is in Toronto, there yeah. are two remarkable silences that I will always treasure. When you finished your stories, there was a silence at the end of each one where we were all very reluctant to leave the moment by making a banging sound with our hands. And um, one was about Arthur Ransom. Oh, and yeah. The other one was about horses. And, oh yeah. Uh, I hope that someday I will be able Do you have either of those on re record uh that we could listen to or is, is it only the memory that we have? They are both available as CDs. But um Okay. But yeah, you know, for me it's about live performance really. CDs are a pale shadow of uh, the real thing. When you when you're actually there with people and that um, mm. shared mm. community of attention that you have with a, with an audience is a different thing. Mm. 
But yeah, for me, the, that silence is worth more than the clapping. You know, that, that moment when people are s s held in the world before they come back to the surface is yeah. worth more than the, uh, yeah. the noise that comes afterwards. Yeah. Can I ask something? I, yeah. have a, I have a story that I tell uh, about the coming of the mosquitoes, how they... Oh, yeah. Okay. I also have a story about the fork in the swallow's tail. Ah. Nothing like yours, quite different. Um, the swallow's tail one comes from Bavaria. Uh, yeah. And I was wondering, will it be okay if I try to remember very hard, very well, the story that you told and then incorporate Of course. That? Of course, exactly. and I, I will credit you. This yeah, my... they're not, it's not my story. I, I'm just, I'm just a, a conduit. That's fine. For, you know, I needed to. But be if sure. you want to find it on the page, there's a very, very mm -hmm. lovely book called Arab Folk Tales. Good. Yeah, Arab Folk Tales. Inia Bushnak. I think it's one of the Pantheon ones now. You know, there's Pantheon, Pantheon yeah. Yeah. Fairy Tale. Mm -hmm. And um, it's in there. Right, Arab Folk Tales. Good. Oh, I, quite, I, I, yeah, I, I love that idea of the conduit. It's much better than <laughs> thieves and liars. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. Okay. Right. Oh, oh, it looks like Norman's found a copy. Ah, there we go. Got it. Yeah, that's the very one. Is that because it first came out as a penguin? I think then it came out as a pantheon. Is that right? Yes. Pantheon I'll put out a whole it. series. Pantheon. Good, it is Pantheon. So those are still available, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, it, it, yeah. and yeah. look up any of that series. Um, yeah, they're all cracking. Bushnak is mm -hmm. quite a... Uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm just showing off, too. What else? Yeah, well, Norm, Norman, you're a wonder. <laughs> Where every, on any um, session you've been in, if a book is mentioned... Yeah, you managed. You not only own it, but you know where it is. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> that is miraculous. That's a miraculous. Uh, that must. You, you must. You must. It. You must never lend your books then. <laughs> I lend my uh, books. Actually, I, I know do. where they are. Can't yet to come back. Yeah. Yeah. But no. A... But the I meant it when I said the stories have to be read. If we don't, sometimes our only sources is print, our print for the stories, other yeah. than, like, I mean, a chance to hear, hear you, he, hear you, you, uh, I'm having a hard time saying that. Um, I, I, I consider it a treasure to be able to hear the stories and the other storytellers on the World Storytelling Cafe. Um, I think that's going to end up being a treasure when all oh. of this is over. It's going to be an absolute legacy for all of you. It's mm -hmm. what you're creating yeah. here, all your storytellers. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Great. You think yeah. in 30 years' time, hopefully, you know, they'll yeah. have updated it to whatever internet we have then. But yeah, what you're doing over this yeah. next lockdown it's period. It's going to be a fantastic resource. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All those voices from so yeah. many places. We, yeah. we have on the, I, I, I just got to, I need to show off a bit here on. And I'm, I'm just reaching across for the schedule, which I should have put in front of me. But in a few weeks' time, on Sunday night, on the 26th of July, we'll have our hundredth teller. Wow! And uh, that that will be. Look, we've got. Well, I thought, thought we we would have someone special, so I've got Liz Weir. I, I thought I thought it would be quite appropriate to have Liz as our hundredth time. Right. Yeah, and uh, she's uh, and so you know we're quite proud of what you know of of this, and we've got people, and we've we've travelled the globe. We've still got some gaps, uh, but there's uh, in in the globe. But we're uh, we're trying our best to to fill those gaps even now. So uh, great. Well, it's a great thing, John. Well, thank you, who for I mean, okay. it's, and I know so we haven't I, had a lot of people in the room, but there will be people all over on different um, different formats watching this, and we'll knock off our first ten minutes when when we were in the room talking, and then it will go up on the archive, 
and all all the stories every session we've done is in the archive so if you go to the site and you just press archive yeah you can go back right till march we started it right at the beginning of lockdown i think march the march the 20 something and uh and so 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 that so everything's there and uh, right. Hugh, Hugh's first session and this session and uh, and thank you Hugh and Norman and everyone else who's either told or watched and thank you for tonight <laughs> Hugh brilliant thank you, thank you. thanks thank you thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank bye you. <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs>